So hello everyone. Welcome to the fourth segment of the Cyberkill Chain series, Exploitation. My name is Rushab, and we'll first go with the presentation about what is the fourth segment, the exploitation. And then after that, we'll have a small demo or I would say a workshop by Nemi. He will show us the attack landscape of modern vehicles and how, how hackers are exploiting them exploiting them. So let's get started with exploitation. So we all know about the lock Lockheed Martin's cyber kill chain. We went through reconnaissance, otherwise known as target selection and spying. An attacker either enters that uh enters this stage with a planned target already established or the attacker searches for a target based on suitability and susceptibility gathering as much information as possible about the target as a goal beginning with the passive information and moving toward more aggressive and active reconnaissance after that we looked at the weaponization phase in this phase the attacker's goal is to modify something a user will encounter to cause a result that favors the attacker attackers can ch change his file change files or binary codes in, in those files in preparation for in preparation to send them as an email attachment to the target. They modify website to execute harmful code once you browse to the site, such as cross-site scripting. The point here is to maliciously change things that you think are safe and interactive and disguise their intent from technical and human means of detection. Then we looked at the delivery phase. Here, cyber weapons and other Cyber skill chain tools are used to infl infiltrate a target network and reach more users. Here we can have phishing campaigns. They are the most probing part of the attacks. And now we will talk about exploitation, which is the fourth step in the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain. Okay, so what is exploitation? Strictly put, exploitation is code designed to execute to leverage a specific weakness on a target system. The goal, they want to gain administrative or root privileges. A broader definition includes exploiting human nature using means of social engineering to obtain sensitive information. However, that is outside of this likely technical discussion. So we'll move on. With the basics, that is how the malicious actors can leverage a specific weakness on a target system. Okay, so the exploitation phase offers a threat actor his or her first opportunity to celebrate victory. One of the considerable size well into this active stages of cyber attack. The celebration also represents an organization's failure on two fronts. Failure to prevent a weaponized object from entering the environment. And second, failure to detect an object once it has it is ex uh, being exploited inside the environment. Other issues that can lead to a successful exploitation can include failing to prevent user interaction with web-based threats. Merrily browsing to a malicious site could trigger the execution of code designed to exploit a vulnerable client. In cybersecurity means that an attacker has discovered a vulnerability in a target's network and plans to exploit that vulnerability. It can include any unpatched services, security misconfiguration in the server, insecure software such as very badly written code with no user authentication or input validation, and the most important of all, poor human infosec awareness. The people are not taught about the importance of security. Let's talk more about it. What? Oh, hi, Megan. Hi. So we are just talking about what is exploitation. Thank you for joining. So for cyber attacks from the meticulously planned to the spur of moment attempts, this is where it is translated into direct action. The malicious code is triggered. The malware attempts to run and the threat actors plan for the cyber attack. Successful ex execution rewards them with the compromise of the target account system 
or other section of the network. However, even failed execution attempts can have adverse effects and can damage an environment. Maybe they can leak some kind of information that they can benefit from. It, the exploitation usually involves a payload that is designed to gain access to a system. A payload is typically a code that is written to exploit the vulnerability and pop up a shell reverse back to the attacker. And examples of payload can come from the MSF console, the Metasploit Framework console. It has an incredible list of payloads. It was created by HP Moore. It's a Ruby-based mo modular pen testing platform. It's the most popular interface is the MSF console. If you guys want to learn more about it, you can open up that link there. It's a podcast from a dark Darknet Diaries regarding how MSF console was created in the first place and how HD Mood developed it and how it is currently used by many security pen testing companies as an example of exploiting payloads. Right. Another example of payloads is the Kali Linux, which comes with a pre-packed loads of useful simple payloads found in the user slash shared directory. Here you will find payloads such as oh. okay. so here you will find payloads such as the regarding the website. Here you can see there is one payload called the PHP reverse shell which basically gives the, the threat actor a reverse shell as root. You can check out, I will show you how this PHP reverse shell works at the end of this presentation. So you can get a better idea of what is an actual example of a payload that can give you a reverse shell. Now we talk about how the payloads execute. The payloads are executed by tricking the user into clicking the payload, such as embedded malicious code into a PDF, a PNG, or a doc file, or any, even an email attachment. Right? They can be further distinguished into zero-click payload and user-executed payload. Payloads mostly consist of shell code, which is a special type of code injected remotely or locally, which lets the hackers exploit a variety of software vulnerabilities. It is named shell code because it typically spawns a commercial, or oh, sorry, a command shell from which attackers can take control of the affected system. You will not likely notice shell code until you have noticed an attack on a computer. Shell code belongs to the area of, I would say, binary exploitation. I mean, yeah, binary exploitation. A shell code is basically a binary form of a payload a piece of code defining the instructions that the attacker wants to execute during the exploitation. Typically, it is written in, a mach uh, it is written in machine code that is appropriate for the target processor, architecture, and the operating system. For example, the Windows uses x86 payload. Although shell coding is about coding, we don't really have to code anything. It is completely uh, automated by exploit frameworks such as the Metasploit framework. And you can find examples of almost all the platforms in that console if you, through the MSF Venom console. If you use the command like MSF Venom dash dash list platform, it will list a huge number of shell codes for various different platforms that you can play with. Then we have user executed payloads. User executed payloads, yes, they usually in, involve social engineering where you, as a threat actor, lead the user to do something malicious, such as clicking an email attachment, opening a malicious, going to redirecting to a malicious URL, or opening a malicious image, or starting a malicious ex binary executable. So since we are talking about exploits and payloads, we have to talk a little bit more about payloads because they are an inseparable part of exploitation. To understand why exploits have payloads, let me ask you a simple question. What happens after we exploit a software bug? Let's say you do a buffer or slow attack. 
what god does it gonna happen to you well turns out we can do whatever we want that's where the payloads come into play because payloads basically define an action that we want to perform after we exploit the vulnerability for instance execute a code spawn a reverse shell create a backdoor create a user or read a file or i mean delete the entire code base who cares anything we want these payloads are typically written in the form of a shell code but it is not a rule to write shell codes for instance you can write the web app exploits they have payloads in text forms if we talk about user executed payloads more users may be subjected to social engineering to get them to open a file that will lead to code execution the user action will typically be observed as a follow on behavior using spear phishing attachment adversaries may use several file types that, re that require a user to execute them such as a doc file a pdf an exe file and they they use the threat actors use various forms of masquerading and obvious obfuscated file or information to increase the likelihood that a user will open them and opening those files triggers or it may trigger a malicious payload this increases the likelihood because when we see files such as which have familiar naming conventions we are more likely to open it we are not going to think that okay is this going to be malicious in some way obviously not not a pdf file then we have zero click payloads this is kind of like i would say a jackpot of payloads because here you don't need any kind of user interaction you just send the payload and it just works out of the blue that is why it is called known as the holy grail of hacking so if you have found a right kind of vulnerability which i'll talk about such as the forced entry vulnerability in iphone and the jeff bezos vulnerability in 2018 they don't have a specific name for it so i just said jeff bezos so here you don't need the user to do anything you deploy the payload and that will exploit the specific service that you want without any user interaction these type of payloads are often because of poorly written code or code written without security in mind such as improper input validation cryptographic failures flawed authentication techniques so the exploit which we call here forced entry yeah it targets apple's image apple's image rendering library and it was effective against apple mac os and watch os devices the citizen lab discovered a zero click exploit that allowed the attackers to install a pegasus a uh, pegasus malware on a target phone using a pdf engineer to automatically execute code the malware effectively turns anyone's smartphone into a listening device that's why it is termed as the it is termed as a zero click exploit because as soon as you get the pdf on your phone it just triggers it automatically without any kind of user interaction with you don't even have to open it. the other one that i that i found was in, that i found interesting was the jeff bezos vulnerability which happened in 2018 so the back story goes in 2018 the crowd prince of saudi arabia he allegedly sent amazon ceo jeff bezos a whatsapp message with a video promoting saudi arabia's saudi arabia's telecom market it was reported that there was a piece of code within the video file that enabled the sender to extract information from bezos iphone over several months this resulted in a capture of text messages instant messages emails and possibly even eavesdrop recordings taken from the phone's microphone after months of searching they were not able to find out how this video i mean the malware inside the video was not able to be detected by their security services this the one reason that they gave was because of the malware being encrypted and as it was sent through whatsapp due to their end to end encryption the malware was encrypted that's why the system was not able to detect it right away and 
it's been four years, but there was they are still not able to find what exactly was in, in that video file that triggered this data extraction information for several months. So that's why it was an interesting zero click payload. I may I may be wrong if they were not able to find out, but but the based based on the research I did, I was not able to find out what exactly triggered the Jeff Bezos 2018 exploit from the video. So most of the exploits happen to get a share. The most it's the most common purpose of the of an exploit or an exploitation. The system access is usually gained through a shell, meaning the threat actor gains command line access to the system. And if you can spawn a root shell, you can basically do anything. And this is often the first component of the breach, also known as the initial access. So this was the phase of this, uh, this exploitation phase of cyber kill chain is considered to be the first step in getting the first shell to pop up. But th this is not the end of the exploitation phase. There are three more phases of what would, would what do you do after you get an initial cell shell? So we'll talk about more in the next part of the series, which will cover the second phase. I would say the second step in a breach, the installation. Then there is command and control, and there are ex action and objectives. What do you what would you do after you gain the access? Okay. Thank you everyone. After this, we have a small workshop by Nemi. He would show you guys on the uh, he would talk to you guys about the attack landscape of modern vehicles and how I could hyper exploiting them. So over to you, Nemi. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you I much. hope I didn't mess up everything. Let me get set up here super quick. Rush, there is a question for you on the lounge chat. Oh, I'm so sorry, I missed it. I, I, found, I think I found the article you're reading. I'm just reading through it right now. I was, oh. just wanted to know how the zero click exploit worked. You said it was a PDF. Yeah, I will send you a link about that. Just a minute. Pretty sure I found it on Google Project Zero Blogspot. Yeah, Keith, you were looking at PDFs and stuff like that and uh, code injection, right? Or shell code and PDFs. Well, yeah, I was reading about how it was not a it was not a uh, shell code. So what happened was a Saudi activist got infected his phone somehow by the NSO's uh, group's Pegasus spyware. And I will tell you how. This is where I found it from. No, that was the video, right? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. This was the other thing. The video was, uh, the video was Jeff Bezos. Oh, right. It was also from Saudi Arabia only. Both were from Saudi Arabia. Both, both are tackling different things. So this is where I found it from. It was last year, discovered by Citizen Lab. They found uh, some malicious, uh, not malicious files, I would say, but files with uh, in the iTunes uh, library. In the iTunes back of, of the device, they found several files with the .gif extensions. And those GIF extensions have attachments in them. And that's what contained the payload. Oh, OK. Yeah. So it, it looked like the .gif file, but it was actually a PSD file. Which is Photoshop. Yes. Yeah. PSD files with Photoshop. And you can hide all kinds of things in that. I use Photoshop a lot when I make stuff. Am I, am I good to start? Yeah, you're, you're good to start. We are recording, Thomas. Probably didn't stop it. Yep, we're still recording. Yeah. All right, so hello everyone. My name is Nemi. Uh, I'm going to be talking about automotive networks and the attack surface of the modern vehicle. Um, it's 
really hot it's it's really easy to uh to go off to go off the rails on this one and you know start talking about like engineering or you know something else like physics or something and uh it, it was really tough to keep it to computer science but i kept it as tight as i could uh let me know if you don't know any of the terms like uh i'm, I'm gonna refer to like abs anti-lock breaking traction control and stuff like that um okay so on to the disclaimer so obviously these these methods uh shouldn't be used for any malicious purposes uh we're dealing with like you know machinery and stuff like that like that if we're not in a simulation so uh everything should be done in a safe manner of if, if you're using a simulation it's going to be safe uh vehicles are complicated systems running tests on your own vehicle may break it and you'll end up with a pretty hefty mechanic bill probably probably have to replace some electrical components so that's probably not very cheap uh, i haven't looked into it but yeah all right so a little bit of motivation some of you have probably heard in the uh pwn to own competition uh this an active team uh, found a remote code execution in the Tesla Model 3, uh, which opened the hood of the vehicle, and uh, some unintended side effects as well. The wipers went off and the, the light started flashing as well. Uh, in the GIF at the bottom there is, uh, I'm not sure if it's Charlie Miller or Chris Valasek, uh, but that's basically, uh, they're in a Jeep and they were able to inject commands to run it off the road on a, uh, they were on a rural, rural farm road, so... You know, it was as safe there as they could be, but as you can see, uh, they got ran off the edge there. Um, turning the steering wheel is actually pretty complicated because in some cars, they don't even have that feature. You kind of have to um, work off the ground, as they say, work off the land and uh, use whatever functions are available within the car's network. So uh, what they actually did, they actually used the, um, they fooled one computer into tricking uh, the car in, into thinking that the car was moving at a slow speed uh, to be able to take, to take control of the steering. And uh, to take control of the steering, they actually used the uh, park assist feature. So if you've ever seen vehicles that parallel park themselves, uh, that's uh, the park assist feature there working. Uh, so they can, they can uh, have some control of the steering in that, in that way. And um, they basically used a communication protocol that's standardized in uh cars boats aviation heavy duty equipment and it's starting to be rolled out into uh like medical equipment uh construction and stuff like that uh things that are that are not vehicles like you know generators and stuff like that it's already been used in construction in tractors and uh you know haulers and stuff like that so um Cars are they're, they're really complicated nowadays. They're not just uh, you know an engine and a powertrain anymore. They're basically a computer on wheels. Uh, here I've just have I just have an image of you know some of the features that modern cars have, and uh, you know a, a lot of us just kind of glaze over this. But th there's really a lot going on all the time, and uh, I could imagine that the uh, the internals of a car are quite noisy regarding electrical signals and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, we got um, airbag deployment, windshield wiper control, you know, little things like voice and data, entertainment, turn signals, navigation, security, the list goes on. So when you first look at a vehicle, there's, there's quite a lot of ways to interact with it. Keys uh, are the first, uh, first thing to think of. Um, I was actually going to do a talk about rolling codes uh, that talks a little bit more about uh, radio frequency hacking. Um, that's a little bit more of a talk within itself, and I kind of uh, uh, went off to the side and uh, wanted to talk more about protocols, which I'll get a little uh, get uh, into a little bit more into this presentation. But obviously, uh, cars have they have physical keypads, uh, distant distance and motion sensors. I'm not sure how those can be exploited, but um, you know, they do take input, uh, Bluetooth and USB, of course, and onboard diagnostic ports, uh, or the steering column or around the glove box, somewhere around there. It's usually uh, how many pins is that 12 or something like that? Um, yeah, big, big plug and, uh, you can connect to it.
All right, so like I said, vehicles have changed a lot over the past few decades. As a pen tester, vehicles should be seen as a semi-isolated network that consists of electrical controlled units and mechanical components like actuators. Uh, modern cars might have up to 70 ECUs, which would cover like all the features um, that I show, showed you in that map before, like, you know, ABS, navigation, GPS, uh, you know, engine control, braking, all that kind of stuff. All the 70 ECUs would cover that. Um, cars with features like Wi-Fi hotspots or telematic control units that uh, phone home to a control center uh, break this isolated network to create a, a larger attack surface. And yeah, Wi-Fi and uh, cellular add to the attack surface there. So I was interested in rolling codes, but I, uh, I kind of uh, went off the path and uh, wanted to learn a little bit more about vehicle bus, bus protocols. So there is kind of like internet in a way and in that it transfers the packets sent by these uh, electrical control units throughout the vehicle network. Um, vehicles can have one or more bus protocols. Um, as most of you know, manufacturers love their own proprietary things, software and all that. So, you know, there's uh, quite a few protocols out there. There's not just one. Uh, one has, however, been standardized. It's the uh, CAN protocol, the control area network. Uh, it's been standard in US built trucks since 1996. Uh, but mandatory uh, since 2008, and it was mandatory in 2001 for European vehicles. Um, CAN is kind of like UDP. Uh, it's, it's kind of like the internet in that it has, um, there's layers to it, and there's a, um, there's a frame with uh, fields. Um, but it's, it's kind of like UDP in that it's connectionless. There's not really any kind of acknowledgement of packets and stuff like that. <clears throat> So, like I said, the CAN bus, control area network bus, facilitates communication between nodes within the car's network. And just a reminder again, nodes can be, you know, uh, navigation, GPS, uh, uh, the engine control unit, timing of the uh, pistons and all that. Um, yeah, airbags. And so w one of the features and why CAN was kind of created is once all these features started rolling out, rolling out in cars, there was quite a mess of wires. And, uh, you know, you have uh, the sensor from the wheel uh, sending information to the anti-lock braking system and also to the speedometer and the dash. And that's two wires coming from the same sensor. And you can imagine how, how quickly that can get messy within a, a car quite compact. And there's a lot of, uh, lot of um, technology in there. So rather than having dedicated wiring with everything, um, CAN uh, uses a bus and the nodes broadcast and every node within the bus will get the message. And uh, whether the message is for that node or not, uh, that depends. So uh, yeah, the bus solves the problem of complicated wiring. This is a uh, standard CAN frame. Uh, I forget how many bits this is, I uh, got it added up. Uh, but this is basically a start of frame. Uh, this is a dominant zero, will always be a zero. Uh, the ID, uh, this is an important field because it, it tells the ID of the node. And this can vary on um, uh, for the manufacturers, like you could have say, BMW has the ID of three for the um, navigation, uh, you know, um, Honda might have an idea of three for the piston timing. It really depends on the manufacturer. They they decide what that goes, what what ID gets what. So and also uh, an important thing to note is that lower values have high priority in IDs. So uh, say that you know you're driving along and um, your your wheels broke up, lock up and you're changing the song. Uh, the the car's going to listen to the ABS, the anti lock brakes, rather than the uh, you know the entertainment system. So the ABS system would have a lower ID than entertainment uh, to have precedence over that, over the uh, communication bus. <clears throat> uh, next one is the remote transmission request. It's basically just a switch saying, hey, I'm requesting data or hey, I'm sending data. 
Uh, next uh, six bits are control. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, I'm going to go back to the ID here. I forgot to mention one thing is uh, there's actually two versions of CAN, and uh, the main difference between them is the length of the, um, the ID field here. So uh, consumer vehicles have 11 bits for the ID. Uh, heavy duty machinery actually has 29 bits. Uh, I'm assuming because they have uh, more nodes going on within them. I'm not quite sure. Um, but yeah, going back to the control here, um, this will tell uh, this will tell the uh, uh, system whether it's a 11-bit um, or 29-bit identifier, and it also contains the uh, length of the uh, data segment here, which is 64 bits maximum, and uh, it has padding. And we also have a cyclic redundancy check for data integrity, an acknowledgement, and uh, seven bits for the end of file or end of frame. Sorry. You guys are probably more familiar with that stuff, more internet stuff than uh, engineering or mechanical. All right, so how, how to connect to the CAN bus? You can't just connect to it through USB or, so, or Wi-Fi or something like that. This, uh, you've, uh, I showed this picture at the beginning with these pins and uh, basically you connect, you get these adapters. This is a uh, CAN to USB adapter. Uh, this one is actually uh, Machina M2. It's a free open source modular uh, onboard diagnostic interface. And you can actually get modules for it. You can get, yeah, Wi-Fi, 3G, LG, cellular GPS modules. Uh, so you can control it that way, which is kind of neat. Uh, I don't know if I'd want to put it on my car, though. Um, there's lots of other kinds. Uh, there's actually direct CAN tapping adapters. Um, can runs all throughout your vehicle. It's everywhere. It runs everything, basically. So um, it, it has a resting voltage of 2.5 volts. Um, so if you're around, if, if you can, you know, you got a multimeter and you can just tap into a wire and it reads 2.5 volts, it's, it's probably can. Um, there's, a, there's a variation of uh, one volt because it's two wires, uh, but that gets, uh, I digress anyway. So. Yeah, to, how, how to connect. Uh, you need an OBD2 adapter. And how it connects USB, Wi-Fi, that's up to you. All right, so I do have a little bit of a demo prepared. Um, the demo uh, is run in a simulated environment, of course, using uh, Instrument Cost Simulator by Craig Smith. Uh, this simulator provides a graphical user interface for the speedometer, turn signals, and the uh, door alerts on the vehicle, just like you'd see in the dash of your car. Uh, it also uh, includes the setup for a virtual CAN interface, and the system, system communi communicates with uh, the control area network protocol. Um, I'll, I'll be running this on Kali Linux, and uh, they actually do have a CAN kernel module that you just have to load. Um, and, and, and that's done uh, with the instrument cluster simulator. He includes a little script just to set up the interface. Uh, and then there's CAN utils as well, which is uh, what you'd imagine it would be. Um, we have uh, CAN sniffer for sniffing packets. Uh, there's lots of options at runtime for filtering and, uh, and things like that. Uh, actually, only filtering. L lots of options for filtering. Uh, can send is for sending one uh, can frame into the uh, into the network. Can dump is for logging. Can player can uh, replay multiple packets from a can dump. Uh, yep, from a can dump file. And can gen just uh, generates. Um, random packets just to see that you uh you know your your uh network's working just sends random bits of data all right so i'm gonna go ahead and close this all right so the first thing i need to do is uh set up my virtual interface so, uh, So 
I'm just running the script in the uh, Git repository. Uh, Git repository here. Set up vcan.sh. Oh, I already set it up. So. We can see that I have can and the virtual can module loaded. And if I do an if config, you will see it there as well. vcan0 is the uh, controller area network interface that we're going to be working with. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is uh, load up the dashboard for the simulator. And the, uh, the option is the interface. Uh, for it to uh, work on. It pops up a GUI. There we go. Uh, I also, I'm going to set up the um, the controller for it. Um, so I can use my keyboard to input commands, uh, input can commands into the uh, the dashboard here. Uh, when I do start it up, the, it does create noise. So the, uh, um, the uh, tachometer on the speed here will actually start moving. Uh, it takes the same arguments as the uh, the dashboard, just the interface that it's running on. There we go. You can see the needle moving a bit. That's just because it's getting a little bit of input from here. Now, let's pull up my notes here. I'm just going to cut. Uh, I'm just going to start can sniffer on this, so you can kind of see what the can data looks like. And the dash, uh, dash C option uh, colorizes uh, change bits, and the, they'll be red. All right. So uh, we've got um, the, the fields that we want to look at here are the ID and the data. Um, we can have uh, more, vo more verbose options, but I'm just going to stick with this for right now. Uh, so we can see. Um, you know, there's a little bit of noise and signal going on, and that's all com coming from the controller here. But what I'm going to actually do is I'm going to keep this running, and I'm going to do a replay attack. It's not even going to be a, an attack. It's going to be more of a, I'm going to accelerate and open some doors, and I'm going to replay the, um, the can messages, the, the, the capture from that. I'm going to do a can dump, and that's going to log to a file, and it's going to read on my virtual can interface. Right? And what I'm going to do, I'm going to accelerate. You'll see on the uh, tachometer that it's moving up. And then as it decelerates, I'm going to let go. I'm just going to open a couple doors and close them. You can see that the doors are open there. And there we go. I close them again. So I'm going to stop. This dump, I'm going to close the controller because when I do the replay attack, uh, the controller is still going to be doing input, gi uh, giving input into this. So it's, it's good. it makes it look a little glitchy. So I'll do the. Uh... Okay. I've got a couple files, make sure I'm using the right one. And play. There we go, and uh, you'll see the same thing happen on here. Hopefully, it worked last time. There we go, the glitching from the controller. See me accelerating. Now I let go of the accelerator. And again, I'm not, I'm not providing any input. Doors are open. Doors are closed. This is all coming from the, uh, the replay. And there we go, and the, the, uh, the pin should stop as well. There we go. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a, a more interesting uh, attack here using, uh, what was it? T -t 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 can send. I'm going to send a single packet and just try and open some doors. So I need to start up the controller again because I'm going to be providing input. Actually, no, I'm not because I already know what it is. Uh, usually, you do a little bit of recon to find the address of the node that you would uh you would want to attack and send some data to uh however i've already done that 
So what I can do is I can do can send. And it's 19B is the uh, the captures quiet. 19B is the uh, the ID of uh, one of the door switches. So if I send it some data, let's say uh, all zeros. See that it's opened all the doors here. And then send it uh, maybe an F. There you go, all the doors closed. And I've noticed that if I've sent a, anything in anything in between, it just kind of opens a couple of random, not random doors, but like two at a time, or it'll, it'll close one and kind of see the uh, the result here. But uh, I believe F was close all of them. So there we go. And um, well, that's my demo. And uh, just in summary. Uh, We went over that vehicles consist of a network of embedded system, embedded systems. Uh, we learned one of the uh, protocols that is standard in all modern vehicles, uh, the control area area network protocol. Um, it's standard in in uh, consumer vehicles, but a lot of the uh, commands are uh, uh, proprietary to the manufacturer. However, in uh, marine aviation, heavy duty, and even medical equipment, the commands are standardized. Um, broadcasts with low IDs have high precedence, and CanUtils is a, a Linux uh, pack of packages that uh, can. Uh, send, sniff, and log uh, CAN data. Okay, thank you.